Yeah, the, the recording is on. All right, okay, thanks, Dr. Eni. So the Christian church did not pay much attention to, to the thinking of Nicholas Copernicus. However, his students and companions, Tato Brahe, continued his study and confirmed that, yes, indeed, the sun was at the center of the universe. This was further followed on by Johannes Kepler. Eventually, it was Galileo Galilei who drove home the point and concretized it in solid scientific findings that the sun was indeed at the center of the universe. At this point, the Roman Catholic Church could not control its anger. It caused Galileo to be arrested. Galileo was prevailed upon to disown his discoveries in 1633. Otherwise, he stood the risk of being killed. Galileo was further prevailed upon by his friends and family. So unwillingly, he recanted, but he did not still gain his freedom until he died in 1642. And let me say at this point that the Roman Catholic Church was forced to eat humble pie only recently, 1992. The Roman Catholic Church finally acknowledged that it was wrong and Galileo was right that the sun was at the center of the universe. Finally, Isaac Newton advanced the findings of Nicholas Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes, Copernic, uh, Johannes Kepler, and Galileo Galilei by adding the law of gravity to what they had found. This then concretized science as the driving force behind nature. At this point, it became clear. At this point, it became clear that science was the way to understand nature. So what did the philosophers derive from these discoveries that were made. What sense did they make of it? The first sense they made was that the universe was made in an orderly manner. There was order in the universe. And the order in the universe was very simple. It was discoverable. And once you discover the order in the universe, you will know how it works. In other words, there were very simple laws that regulated the universe. And that could be discovered by man, if man used his reason, his rationality carefully. So complex though the universe may be, vast though it may be, there was order to it. There was simplicity to it. There were laws that regulated it. And all that man needed to do was to carefully 
apply science to discover the order that regulated the universe. Alexander Pope, a poet, for example, impressed with these discoveries, put it in a very terse poem, a mighty maze, but not without a plan. A mighty maze, but not without a plan. What were the further things that the enlightened philosophers derived from the enlightenment? And this is of particular interest to us as scholars in the academy. And I believe that this is what Dr. Eni was hinting at when in the introduction, he said that this lecture was significant in many respects. The intellectuals, the philosophers, developed a simple, effective, and efficient process for knowledge production, which they call the scientific method. The scientific method consists of four logical steps for gathering and testing intellectual ideas to produce knowledge. The first is the identification of a problem or a question which has arisen from observation and which requires an answer. For example, why does the sun come up every morning in the east and at a certain time in the day, it vanishes completely? This is a question that requires an answer. Is a problem that re uh, requires resolution. Or why is it that it rains at certain times of the year and at certain times it does not rain at all? Is a problem or a question that requires an answer, a question that requires resolution. So the philosophers argue that the first logical step in knowledge production is that one must identify a problem, a question, an issue from careful observation that would require an answer, that would require a resolution. Today, of course, we refer to that as the research question. So as intellectuals, we begin our knowledge production process by identifying a research question, a question that requires an answer, a problem that requires resolution. The second step in the knowledge production process <laughs> That we must. This is Dr. Koki Bako from um, the history department. So he's the one taking steps. Is there an issue? I hear somebody else speaking. Can I go on? Yes, yes. Someone's mic was accidentally on. I've put it on. All right. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Aining. The second step in the knowledge production process is that we must propose an unproven assumption. We must propose an answer, an answer that need not necessarily be the answer to the problem or the question that we have identified. 
Today, we call that a hypothesis. And in practical terms, that means, could it be this? Could it possibly be this? That then assists us to begin working with certain assumptions. The third step in the scientific method, the knowledge production process, a very important point is that having identified a problem that we must resolve, having proposed a tentative answer to the problem, we must now move into the field to collect data. We must now gather data concerning the problem so as to assist in the resolution of the problem. The data collection process is sometimes for our friends in the hardcore science referred to as experiment. For us in the humanities and the social studies, we refer to that as film work. But basically, however we refer to it, it is the gathering of empirical evidence that should assist us to resolve the question with which we began our inquiry, the question with which we began our knowledge production process. The fourth and the last step in the scientific method is that after we have collected our data, we must collect the data. In other words, we must bring it all together. We must analyze the data. In other words, inquire into what it is telling us, what it says to us, and we must interpret the results of the data that we have collected. This would then enable us to arrive at an informed conclusion. And a conclusion that would either confirm wholly our hypothesis or partly our hypothesis or completely negate our hypothesis. But at least will give us some information that would answer the problem that we set out to inquire into. Now, having established this as the known method for knowledge production, the philosophers then began to apply this method to every aspect of human existence. They use this process to, uh, to uh, study human nature. They use it to study politics, law, education, history, philosophy, everything that you can think about. So you find that in the academy, the only thing that matters in knowledge production is the application of the scientific method. You cannot produce method, uh, knowledge without applying the scientific method. As such, the enlightenment enabled the philosophers to take away superstition, guesswork out of the knowledge production process. For example, 
in the past, during the medieval period, if there was a flood and people in the society affected by the flood wondered why there was a flood. The simple answer that will be given was that you have disrespected God and God is punishing you by flooding your environment. If there was abundance of food and people rejoice for the abundance of food and they inquire as to why there was abundance of food, the answer will be simple. Ah, God is happy with your behavior. You have worshiped God as suspected of you and God is rewarding you for your obedience to him by abundance of food. So diseases were seen in terms of the wishes of God. Um, activities in the political realm were seen in terms of the wishes of God. And that was how simply intellectual life ran. But with the development of the scientific method, during the enlightenment, it became clear that things that drove nature, things that worked in nature could be fully understood with the application of scientific principles, the principles of the enlightenment and without reference to myth, mythical ideas, Christian ideas, without myth, to, uh, without reference to superstition. Having established that, the philosophers then applied their method to many great areas that affect human beings. One of the great areas has been the medical sciences. And the first thing that benefited from the scientific method is inquiry into why human beings fall ill and sometimes die. And the reason was found in the germ theory, which is also the reason why when a human being dies, there is post-mortem to find out what entered the body, which ought not to be there. That caused the anomaly that eventually killed the human being. Of course, many other areas benefited from the scientific method. Um, I'm sure by now you're wondering how politics benefited. So let me uh, focus on that as a way of running up the lecture. Before the advent of the enlightenment and the scientific method, political leadership was hereditary and political authority could not be challenged. However, with the advent of the enlightenment and the scientific method, it was believed that there should be popular participation in politics. Political ideas and political participation should be democratized. And the enlightenment ideas challenged inequalities in society. So all the benefits that we have today in politics, free participation in politics, free speech in politics, 
free expression of ideas in politics and in society are all direct consequences of the enlightenment and the development of uh, the scientific method. Of course, the enlightenment and the scientific method found expression also in economics. The whole idea of uh, free trade, uh, free market economy, all developed as a result of the application of the theories that were developed during the enlightenment period and also during uh, the formulation of the scientific method. I believe I should uh, pull a break at this point and open the floor for discussions, i.e. your questions, your comments that would uh, enable us to uh, take the conversation further. But just before then, as you can see from the slide that I've just opened, uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment were propagated through institutes and academies, and the ideas were publicized in journals and encyclopedias. That is the basis for laying emphasis on publication in the academy. Of course, uh, I have more than made this point many times already that uh, our modern scholarship owes a lot to the scientific method. Our democratic principles owe a lot to the development of the enlightenment and the scientific method. Our modern science and technology are all things that we inherited from the scientific method. So in conclusion, and just before you begin to fire your questions, the Enlightenment exhibited skepticism towards tradition, i.e., and by tradition we mean the emphasis on the fact that this is how it has always been. The Enlightenment said, no, that is not the way to go. We must try new scientific ideas. The Enlightenment laid emphasis on human reason and the capacity of human beings when, if they use their reason to generate science that would change the world. The Enlightenment was convinced that human nature exhibited regularity and uh, harmony. And the Enlightenment believed that science paved the way to the advancement of civilizations and progress. For those of you who want to pursue this subject further, there is a book that looks at the subject very well, very easy to read, and very easy to understand. Um, and you can pursue that in the BAM library and in the Department of History library. Just as a way of providing some comfort for you, I will pass on the slides to both Dr. Enim and also Professor Adika to pass on to you. So now we have probably come to the end for your questions, your comments, and your contributions. And I believe Dr. Enin would moderate. Over to you, Dr. Enin. Thank you, Dr. Baku. I enjoyed your lecture just like I enjoy it every year. Now it's time to get reactions from uh, new participants for the year. Um, so, uh, David, your hand is up. So probably you can shoot on with your question. 
Thank you so much, Doc, and thank you so much, Dr. Baku, for uh, for the enlightenment. Um, so, your definition of enlightenment was um, the emphasis on reason as the best method of arriving at knowledge. So it mean it meant that there were other methods that were probably not accepted or not seen as the best. And so I think indirectly I got a sense of some of them. I don't know if you would want to um, identify some specific methods that were in existence then until they arrived at the, if you like, best uh, form of enlightenment. My second comment is how literature benefits, the, the discipline of literature benefits from the enlightenment. And finally, um, it's just a provocative question, like why are we doing this at this time? Um, I believe that this discussion or this enlightenment is really valuable, very useful, but why now? Why aren't we doing this in our primary schools? Why, what, what, what is so difficult about telling um, our six-year-olds, our five-year-olds about this rather than what, what they are currently doing in school? Because I've been monitoring uh, some of the things they are doing at school and sometimes it appears at variance with this knowledge and I'm worried why we, it will, we have to wait up to you get to a PhD level for you to have such a core um, enlightenment like this to be presented to you. Thank you. Okay, um, David, you asked three questions. So probably the other people you can wait so that uh, Dr. Waku can take on the three of them before we, uh, you know, before we uh, lose memory of them. Thank you very much, Dr. Aini. Uh, the first question that David asked is what were the other forms of uh, knowledge production that um, uh, existed before the enlightened philosophers, before the enlightenment laid emphasis on the use of reason. The main form which existed was what the enlightened philosophers referred to as superstition. And by superstition, they were referring to the Christian uh, mode of knowledge production. And the Christian mode of knowledge production uh, took its base from the Bible and also guesswork. And as I indicated in the lecture, if you pose any question as to why things happen, the answer invariably was, uh, was given by reference to Christian literature or some form of guesswork. So if you like, the answer to that question is that the two dominant modes of thinking about things ha that happened in the universe were myth and Christian beliefs, both of which the philosophers referred to as superstition. Myth in the sense that societies that were not Christian explain things that happen around them not in terms of human reason, but in terms of their gods and goddesses, things that the Greeks and the Romans did before they encountered the Jews and Christians. So in one word, superstition was the basis for knowledge. 
how would literature benefit from this? Literature, uh, as if I understand you, literature as, for example, in uh, English or in our Ghanaian languages. Basically, literature, to produce knowledge in literature, one would have necessarily have to apply the scientific method. And the scientific method should not appear mysterious to you. The modern rendition of the scientific method is the proposals that we write. And if you take note of the scientific method as established by the philosophers, and you look at the proposal that you are expected to write for your work before you begin your PhD research, you find that it is simply an expanded version of the scientific method. In other words, everything that is in the proposal is in the scientific method or has its origins in the scientific method. So literature in any subject or so ever would benefit from this. Why now? Why not earlier? Good question. Um, the question would be, how can we, and this question is uh, pedagogical, how can it be formulated for understanding at lower levels of education? How would they apply it? It's a scientific question that the philosophers will urge us to examine and find solutions to. It's a question that I believe we cannot have a ready answer to now. I can only share my experience with you. I have persuaded the Department of History in Lagon and in, and, and in Winneba also to teach this course as part of the introduction to the study of history. Uh, but, but we have discovered over the years that no matter how we try to reduce it at the lowest level, students find it difficult to come to terms with. But it, it does not mean that we must stop. It does not mean that there are, we will not have better ways of doing it. It only means that we must do what the philosophers have taught us to do. We must continue to inquire as to what better ways are there for us to do it so that people at lower levels can understand it. And why now? Of course, you are setting out to do research, which must be empirically based. Nothing that you do which is not empirically based will not suffice to earn you a PhD. So this is the time that the lesson must be driven home even harder, that you must keep your eye on the gathering of empirical data. Otherwise, you will not do good work for the PhD. If I may draw an example from history, we all, and this is something that you all share in because I, I believe is a, there are pieces of stories that you share in or you heard in, at lower levels of education. We all heard the story of uh, Okonfanochi conjuring down the golden stool from the sky. We have also heard the Asante say that they descended by means of a golden chain. 
and landed safely at a place in Kumasi called Ahinsan. We have also heard other accounts talk about emerging from boats, clutching onto stools called Ahinikoko. The question for us as knowledge producers is that when we go to gather empirical data, this is the kind of data we'll be told. This is the kind of information, evidence will be given. And yes, speaking as a historian, as oral tradition. Question, are we supposed to reproduce this in our writing and leave the matter there and let it suffice for a PhD? Or are we expected to analyze this intellectually, scientifically? I believe the answer is that this must be analyzed scientifically and intellectually. And it is the analysis that will make our PhD. So yes, our empirical data would be that a confinement guarded uh, or confinement conjured Go, the golden stool from the heavens. The Asantis descended from the heavens by means of a golden chain. But it is our analysis. It is our scientific interpretation, our application of the scientific method to this that will make our evidence gathered from the field worthy of knowledge production. I hope I have uh, satisfied you. If I have, then we can go on to the next set of questions. Okay, okay. Um, between Nez Amuzu, I, think, I believe you are the next. Yes, thank you, Doc. Uh, my name is Twin Amuzu. Uh, thank you, Doc. I uh, really enjoyed the, the lecture. Uh, but I think that uh, I'm a little um, dissatisfied because uh, I haven't had I haven't had much emphasis on an African uh, perspective or contribution to the enlightenment or the discovery of knowledge or the process of um, um, developing knowledge, the scientific method as you, you had mentioned it. Added to that is the acceptance of the periodization uh, for our part of the world, as you had indicated. I'm really concerned about the first uh, period, which is uh, the pre-colonial pre period and the acceptance of the definition of that period as the earliest times to 1890. Doesn't the earliest times without a breakdown do a disservice to the African, to the, the, the reason I'm saying this is if we're able to break that period down, the earliest time, we should be able to investigate what our own contributions are, uh, where, to the generation of knowledge. Try to particularly try to find out if we will have uh, the cont African contempor contemporaries of uh, uh, Galileo, Galilea, as you mentioned, Isaac Newton and co. So this is what is making me a bit uh, uh, dissatisfied. I feel, a bit, I feel a bit hollow from, from this uh, uh, perspective because I would have loved, as an African study in an African university, a, a bit more of uh, inquiry in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Anik, can I go? Oh, yes, yes. Um, All right, okay, so thanks for the question. Um, at a pity, you are dissatisfied, largely because you have not heard of uh, Africa. Uh, in all of this, and also because you are not too happy with the way 
African history has been theorized. I think some further clarification is needed at this point. Number one is that periodization only enables the history of a region to be broken down into segments that could be studied very well. And the names that are given to the periods arise out of the dominant events of the period. So if we take European history, for example, the classical period is dominated by the classical civilizations, largely the Greek, Roman, and other civilizations. The medieval period, which is also known as the Christian, and as I've explained, was dominated by Christian ideas. And the last period being the modern period is exactly what we're talking about. The dominance of this period by scientific and technological ideas. Now, the classification in African history is simply done also on the basis that the entire period of African history from when Africans began organized societies up to the time that Africa was colonized is the pre-colonial period. That does not mean that, and, and in fact, I struggle to think of what further breaking down you expect. Because if we look at the pre-colonial period, that means that everything that happened, including the equivalence of Galileo uh, Galilei or Nicholas Copernicus, if they existed, could be exist, uh, could be examined. The challenge that African history has in studying that period is that you don't have sufficient evidence to construct a coherent knowledge base. But the period itself exists. The question is, how do you come by the evidence? Because as we have learned from the scientific method, we cannot guess what happened during that period. We cannot base our knowledge production on guesswork. We can only base it on concrete scientific evidence. So yes, from the earliest period to the time that Europe colonized Africa, many things happened in Africa. Those for which evidence exists have been gathered together and studied scientifically. The pyramids, in uh, Egypt, the Egyptian civilizations for which concrete, tangible evidence exists have been studied. The civilizations of the great Zimbabwe, the civilizations of the Western Sudan and many other such civilizations have been studied and are available for us. But other aspects of it do not have the concrete, tangible evidence on which to, to base solid scientific knowledge. That is a challenge for the study of all aspects of African history. This challenge does not exist only for Africa as a challenge that exists for all the other continents. So scholars on the other continents lament unavailability of concrete 
tangible evidence to study the entire run of their histories. But where the evidence exists, they are produced. What is the evidence of African application of the scientific method in knowledge production? Of course, it exists in all the African universities. The papers that you write must necessarily conform to the scientific method. Otherwise, your paper will be rejected at the level of peer review and will not be published. So the papers that African academics publish about African societies conform to the scientific method. So that is already something that is part of African intellectual life, African scholarship. It has been ongoing for so long as Africans join the knowledge production process. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Um, Timothy, I believe you are the next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. I think Mr. Amuzu has asked my question, but uh, I'm also worried. I feel very hollow after listening to the lecture. But um, uh, you touch on the African civilization in Egypt, Greece, Zimbabwe, etc. Um, I know that in history, for instance, in Egypt, uh, great thinkers like Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras, I learned they came to Africa and studied mathematics, I think for 25 years. Plato too came, he did the same thing, and then uh, Pythagoras, 25 years, he came to learn. And these people, you know, mathematics um, it is also, um, it follows this, an experiment, it follows this scientific method. And it is there in history for people to, to read that these people have re really learned or studied in Africa. So when the picture is painted as if Africa, we have not invented anything, we have not done it. Is it not a deliberate attempt by the West to suppress maybe what we have achieved and make us feel very little in this part of the world? Thank you. Okay, um, I guess um, Dr. Mbaku has um, spoken to that. Uh, unless he still wants to elaborate on what you just raised, which I, I think is uh, the same as what um, the, the, the previous um, person had uh, raised. Uh, we could take uh, a question also from uh, Dodzi Hatu. Dodzi, are you ready? Uh, please, my question is very simple. It has to do with the periodization, uh, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial. I'm just waiting for a day that is, don't we have, can't we get any term apart from these terms that we use? Because anytime I hear this term philosophically, I question, uh, 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 the notion, the, 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 the presuppos presuppositions of the term colonialism. Even the, in the terminology, the pictures behind the terms, uh, uh, philosophically, it does not sound well in the context of Africa's uh, 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 growth. I'm just thinking of it. if we can be any alternative term to that word, pre-colonialism, colonialism, and post Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I think we can take another question before Dr. Baku can um, address uh, your concern. 
Reverend All right. Elijah. Uh, Dr. Ani, Dr. Ani, just one second. Okay, okay. I lost connection after I answered the question. Okay, okay. So I did not hear the question that was posed. Okay. okay. I've just rejoined. Yes. Okay, so Dodzi, you have to repeat your question. Uh, Dr. Beko, I was trying to ask whether there are alternative terms for the periodization terms you use as pre-colonialism, colonialism and, uh, and post-colonialism. Because I feel that the terms were used with a practice, a presupposition that seems to bring out slavery, that seems to bring out the idea of non-enlightenment in, in, in the colonial era. So I don't know whether they can get alternative terms to them. I'm just philosophically considering those thoughts. Thanks. Dr. Ani, can I go? Oh, uh, yes. All right. Thank you, uh, Doji, for your, your question. I do not know of any alternative terms for it. But uh, these terms are simply terms that have been created by the academy. And basically, in this regard, this term is a term that was created by, Af these terms were created by African historians. And as I explained, creating terms to describe historical periods um, is simply done on the basis of the dominant features of the period. So if we take the first period, it is the pre-colonial period. In other words, Africa before it was colonized by Europe. So when Africa was on its own. The second period is the colonial period. Africa when it was colonized by Europe. And these are all dominant historical events that affected Africa. And the last period being uh, Africa after the end of colonial rule. Personally, as an academic historian, I don't see anything wrong with it. And I wouldn't argue that these terms be changed. For that reason, I have not even thought about the subject. And I don't think that my colleague, professional historians, academic historians have thought about it. Do you have any suggestions for alternative terms? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of alternative terms now because it appears these terms only situate African existential conditions and historical perspective based on colonialism. And I feel that there is something more than colonialism. Uh, our history is everything about, can't we get any, so I'm thinking of it, Professor, since we have said so, maybe I'll, I'll look at it. It can even be a basis for my thesis anyway. Thank you. Okay, Thank you very much. What, one of the things that you can do is to do as the enlightened philosophers have been treated us to do. Write an academic paper on it. <laughs> Research it and write an academic paper on it. Thank you, Dr. In other words, this is a problem that requires resolution. A question yes. that needs to be answered. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Baku, I believe you were also offline when Timothy was asking his question. So Timothy, can you repeat your question? Okay, um, thank you very much. I said um, that my question was like that of Mr. Muzo. Yes, um, and I was talking about the civilization in Egypt, the pyramids, and also mathematics, that some great thinkers in the world like Socrates, um, Pythagoras and then uh, Plato, who came to study mathematics in Africa for uh, 25 years. So looking at all these contributions, and you know mathematics requires a very rigorous scientific method. So does it mean 
uh, these people did not contribute to the, the to the enlightenment, even a deliberate attempt by some people somewhere to suppress the good work that Africans we have done, thinking that we did not partake in the enlight enlightenment and that it was only Europeans. Uh, I, I can't get it. To me, I'm a bit, I feel a bit hollow, as my friend said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bunufie, I think you have completely misconceived the idea. Nobody has been uh, suppressing anything. As I indicated, those achievements of Africa that are tangible and have evidence have all been studied. The election is about an European phenomenon, an European development. The lecture is not about African development. So that explains the slant. Even so, even so, the issue at hand is this. And the question that you should be asking yourself in terms of the lecture is how did, how and why did Europe transition from its superstitious beliefs to scientific belief? And as I've explained, the answer is partly because of European incursions out of Europe to the Far East, but Europeans, European introspection. And that introspection found expression in the fact that in classical times, Greek and ancient Romans and their interactions with African civilizations yielded developments that were not superstitious, superstitiously based, but they yielded developments that were born out of human achievements. That then resolved the issue for Europeans that human beings were the agents of change, which is why African civilizations emerged. And that is why when the Greek and the Romans met them in the era of the Greek conquest, they borrowed and learned from them. And that the Greek and the Romans themselves using human ingenuity developed what they developed. And therefore the way forward for Europe was no longer to believe that they would achieve progress and development if they believed in the Christian God. And that the way forward was when they believed in their faculty, in their capacity to reason and rationalize and logically deduce issues from empirical findings. So I believe that is a takeaway lesson. So in all of this, Africa finds expression. Africa is not marginalized at all in this explanation. Can we go on with other questions, please? Uh, Dr. Ani. Yes. Uh, please, this is Lamte. If, if, can you give me maybe just a minute or two to say something to the response um, Doc just gave, please. Um, okay, if it's about the subject, that's fine. Before we take the next question, Doc. Yes, you can... uh -huh. yes sir. Um, I think um, the, the response Doc gave, uh, Doc, Dr. Baku gave, that is the worry of those two gentlemen who asked about Afri um, Africa's place in this. Yes. It is the history of Europe that we are treating. 
the, 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 the problem is why are Africans, even at this PhD level, treating scientific method as an invention of Europe? When there is evidence that Africans um, in, the, in the Islamic period, uh, Mansa Musa, those there were Sudan, Mali, Songhai, and even ancient Egypt had perfected the scientific method even before Europe came into it. You see, and if we focus on this as uh, the text we have to use, then for those who don't have knowledge outside the European history, they get the impression that science is an invention of Europe. And that's, um, uh, and if I should say that's the worry, those two other gentlemen, uh, they, um, um, Timothy and um, uh, Tunisi, uh, um, I think that's their worry. So thank you very much. Yes, so um, those worries can lead to uh, further research if they cannot be supported by uh, already published research. So if there, is, you, if there is published research on the origins of uh, African science, then that's why you can present it to us and we can see it. If there isn't, then it is even more fortunate for you because you then have the opportunity to embark on that research and okay, you know, make great publications that will be to your, your credit. Yes. And if we see the publications and you know the arguments in them are cogent, then we can incorporate them in our studies. All right, sir. Yeah, I think it's just as simple as that. Reverend Elijah. Yes, sir. So this is um, Brother in Reverend Cromwell. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here with uh, Reverend Elijah. I'm the one who wants to ask the question. Oh, OK. Um, so my question is um, for this on uh, the scientific method and um, the way the Enlightenment actually prevailed on the whole world uh, to, to accept the scientific, scientific method of, of, of um, doing things, of getting to the truth. Um, one uh, German philosopher by name Hans George Gadamer um, uh, criticized this approach of um, uh, of doing things, and um, in his view, the objectivable way of um, verifying things may not necessarily or always lead to the truth, and therefore, it's it's just one way of going about it. And uh, he he proposed that yes, uh, there should be a dialogue. A dialogue between objectivity and and subjectivity, in order to increase the the, the horizon of the of the of the individual. And um, I, Doc, I want I want your take on on this the dialogue between, uh, uh, for instance, science science and in religion. Um, uh, can that help us? Is the science method the only way to go? Um, these are some of the questions that natural part are, are about to me. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Reverend, for your, your question. Um, the German philosopher and the German philosopher and intellectual that you referred to proposed a dialogue between uh, objectivity and subjectivity. Yes. I wonder what form that um, uh, dialogue 
would uh, take. The postmodernist thought that has lately developed, which is uh, in, 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 uh, in a way related to the kind of idea that the German philosopher uh, intellectual has uh, suggested uh, still believes that when you want to create a dialogue between objectivity and subjectivity, it must be concretely situated. The, so I don't know how, what form this dialogue will take. The question I have in return for you is how do we ascertain knowledge if we cannot concretely ascertain it? How do we know that this is knowledge when we cannot concretely ascertain it? Can we simply say that belief is knowledge? Have faith that this is it, and that rest the matter? That was a challenge that the enlightened philosophers answered. And for them, the answer rested in the scientific method. If anybody believes that faith, belief, a claim can suffice as knowledge, they should be able to demonstrate it to our understanding, all right? If they are able to demonstrate it to our understanding, of course, knowledge production has always been dynamic. So the academy would adopt it as a process of knowledge production. But until that is done, a claim about it, that there should be a dialogue, that there is merit in subjectivity, and therefore it should take place. I leaves a little bit a uh, uh, lack of clarity for the academy to handle. Mind you, the issue that the academy is confronted with, the issue that the intellectuals of the 18th century were confronted with is how do we produce knowledge with certainty? That is the reason why they laid considerable emphasis on empirical verification, what they call empiricism. Whatever you call knowledge must be concretely empirically verified. A claim based on faith a claim based on uh, belief would not meet that test. And if an intellectual says, no, I don't accept that, of course, freedom of operation would entitle us to grant that uh, intellectual, that philosopher is freedom. Yes, Dr. Eni. Yeah, Victoria, do you, are you there? I'm here. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going back to the African and the superstition aspect that Prof mentioned. I find the lecture to be interesting. You know, right now we have the scientific method and I'm trying to know the why, you know, I'm, I want to know why this is currently happening in Ghana. I want to put it on a bigger picture because we have the knowledge now. And if Prof brought some Akan and the origin stuff, and I quite remember that in our village, there were days that we were not supposed to go to farm and we believed that they were river gods. So when you do this, this God will do that when you, so the water bodies were protected. 
But currently, when we come to Ghana, we are now with the knowledge and everything that we have. The superstitions that we were kind of saying that it wasn't the right thing, we have now delved away with it. And we are currently destroying the river bodies that those that were guiding it with the superstition were able to protect it. So what is happening? Why is it that we, with all the scientific method or with all the technology and all the knowledge that we have acquired, we are rather destroying the things that those with their myth and the superstition were able to protect. If I, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Okay, thank you for your question. Okay. All right, so thank you, uh, Victor Alfori, for your comment and question. Yet again, I think that uh, my explanation was not fully appreciated. The narrative is the mythical or the superstitious one. Beneath the narrative is the science. The intellectual, the scientific knowledge producer is supposed to work out the science behind the mythical claim. Okay? So the issue is this. There is a river god that says you must not go to do A, B, or C to this river on Tuesday. So everybody believes it. And people do not do it. Question that the scientist the scientific method will ask is that, is there indeed a river god that has imposed this prohibition? This is the kind of knowledge you gather from the field. But how do you process it, process it as real knowledge? Processing it as real knowledge will reveal the science behind it. So the issue is that the fact that you have identified the science from it, uh, behind it does not mean that you go and vandalize the river body. So do not equate your vandalization of the uh, uh, river body with the, uh, the, 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 how do you call it? The, the, the benefits of, uh, of uh, myth and superstitious knowledge. Maybe let me clarify it further for you. The scientific method says, go behind the myth, go behind the superstition. Give us an interpretation that is empirically verifiable. Story from your village. River God says, do not touch this river on Tuesdays. Obedience to that injunction then preserve the river body. But the, the science behind it is the preservation of the river body. Does it mean that once you take out the superstition, you must go and vandalize the river body? That's a question we must answer. So what we are doing is pure vandalization pure uh, 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 engaging in destruction of things that have been preserved for us throughout the ages. 
It is not because we have thrown away superstition. Now, what is the value of myth and superstition? Myth and superstition is simply to create an adhesive glue that would compel obedience. So even if myth and superstition does not exist, there must be some other thing that would ensure the obedience to the rule that would ensure sustenance. That is what we are not doing. So ours is indiscipline. Ours is not a question of throwing away superstition and therefore superstition is good. The scientific method says that once we understand the reasoning why water bodies must be preserved, that reasoning by itself should ensure that you preserve water bodies. You don't need the fear of the river God to preserve water bodies. That is what we have not succeeded in doing. And that we must blame ourselves for. Yeah, the, the water bodies in most of, in all through Europe, their water bodies are very clean. And they, so I, I think we need to separate uh, issues, just like Dr. Baku said. Uh, indiscipline cannot be taken as uh, the scientific method. Now we have two more questions, uh, although our time is uh, fast, uh, you know, fast uh, coming to fruition. Uh, Joshua, Otabil, and Foster. I think each of you will just shoot off for a few seconds each. So Joshua, can you? Okay. Um, very beautiful presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, but doctor, I would like to know, um, I will be right if I say that philosophy or love of knowledge or scientific methods cannot understand um, how do you call it, uh, spirituality. Humans created knowledge and all these were got through physical things and spirituality is things of the spirit. And it will be difficult for science to understand um, spirituality. Uh -huh. So for me, I feel that it is time for that separation to be made. That science cannot, I mean, um, research into spirituality and get a result because spirit is not something you can see. It's not physical. It's not something you can touch. So would I be right if I say so? Thank you. Yeah, that's fine, Joshua. Um, I'm not sure scientists are claiming they can understand spirituality, but I think that will be left for Dr. Baku to answer. So first, can you just quickly ask a question? And then yeah, briefly, thank you very much, doctor, for the lecture. Briefly, I just want to ask, is there any possible intersection between faith and then science? Is there any possible intersection between faith and science? And then, uh, Pakweku, pa can you also quickly ask yours and then um, Dr. Baku will round up. All right, um, I just want to ask um, whether the enlightenment period, religion was entirely eschewed or there were some elements that try to hold on to religion, maybe in some rational form during the enlightenment. Okay, Dr. Baku, I think um, now we can just address your questions. And we'll... All right, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Aini. Dr. Aini, I think you did a good job for me by uh, partly answering the first question. 
the science does not make any pretense at all to uh, investigate spirituality and to understand spirituality. Science simply says that it is founded on that which is known and that which can be ascertained. And that is what science seeks to do. Science is not worried at all about the claims that spirituality makes for Isaac. Science sees itself as operating in an entirely different domain from spirituality. And it doesn't see an intersection between the two. And that takes me to the second question, whether there is any meeting point for faith and science. Science, as I understand it from the scientific method, does not create space for an intersection between faith and uh, science as a tangible, knowledgeable thing that the scientific method claims. The scientific method that religious ideas belong to the religious realm and scientific ideas belong to the empirical, verifiable realm. Last question. Were there some members of the enlightenment who professed religious faith? Yes. Yes. But the beginnings of the enlightenment uh, marked a transition a transition in which uh, there were cultural ideas that people could not easily tear themselves away from. But as science and technology matured, the successors of the enlightened philosophers uh, dropped their religious ideas completely. But even so, in the initial periods of the Enlightenment, many vocal Enlightened philosophers condemned Christian religion. Voltaire, for example, declared indignantly that a crasé l'enfant erased the infamous thing. In other words, get rid of the Christian religion. But not all the philosophers were prepared to go the full way that Voltaire went. But as it progressed and science concretized itself and science demonstrated its onward march with empiricism and empirical verifiability, many more people moved out of the a spiritual realm and accepted science. I believe that part of the difficulty for us, and this I say from my pure analysis of the situation, is that we are caught up in our cultural realms, we are caught up in our religious beliefs, and therefore we are unable to appreciate fully the points that were developed by the philosophers. And we are able to, uh, we are disabled from seeing, we are disabled from seeing uh, the uh, signs of the, uh, of the philosophers and their scientific method in its full uh, in its fullness. Many, for many, many years that I've done this work and in teaching the enlightenment, many people have come to me and have said, so sir, are you saying there is no God? Oh, sir, are you saying that there, is, there are no witches? Sir, are you saying that there are no this or there are no that? The question is that one belongs to the spiritual realm, the other belongs to the scientific realm, and it's a question of your 
personal belief systems and cultural uh, orientations. Thank you very much, Dr. Enning. Well, thank you, Dr. Baku. So I can just um, sum up by saying that um, I think we made some achievements today. Uh, like I told you, I enjoy this lecture every year. Yeah. And, and in addition, it appears some people have found uh, dissertation topics. So <laughs> I, I humbly request that those who want to embark on that journey, uh, please try to uh, hold on to the list of those who attended this meeting so that as you are developing those uh, projects in your departments, you can invite us to your seminars and your viva. <laughs> Yes, so I seriously encourage you to take it up. I, I mean, if, if but, but remember to read the literature thoroughly before you start so that you are sure of what you want to contribute and what is lacking, you know. So thank you very much. Uh, at, we have just two minutes to go. I, I think um, uh, nature will forgive us for closing two minutes ahead of the time. So okay. Dr. Matthew, we, are, we are very grateful once again, and we uh, ask you to come back again next year. May nothing hold you from coming back next year and subsequent years. Um, all right, so thank you everybody. Um, we, we, next week, we shall be uh, looking at my topic, uh, a topic uh, something I'm going to present about um, postmodernism. So today we did modernism. Next week it will be. Bye. All right. So thank you very much and bye.